Lahavin Inyan Lecha Mishnah. The Maimer is asking the question, we need to understand the concept of Lecha Mishnah, two loaves of bread, which of course we have a custom to use, two whole loaves on Shabbos as well as on Yom Tif. And of course the reason for the two loaves of bread is because on Shabbos there was no mon, the Jewish people didn't get mon on Shabbos, they got mon only on Friday, but they got Lecha Mishnah, they got double portion of mon on Friday, and because of that there is a custom that on Shabbos we have two Breads, and they were, they're supposed to be whole. And the Rebbe says, Sheesh hefresh ben apinigla, o ben apinister. There's a difference between the practical way we do Lecha Mishneh according to Halacha, and the practical way we do Lecha Mishneh according to Kabbalah. Shal pinigla tzarech liyazal gabezeh. According to Halacha, the two breads are supposed to be one on top of the other, one is higher than the next. And according to Kabbalah and Hasidus, it's supposed to be side by side. And if you remember the Rebbe doing Lecha Mishnah, you've seen photos and there are pictures, the Rebbe would stand up the two breads and put the, the backs of the breads against one another. Um, and then he would slice into one of them, into the one that was on the right, and the two breads were, so to speak, being held up one opposite the next. Because this is how you're supposed to do it, up in Ister. And this is the Maimir which is exploring this concept of Lecha Mishnah. Of course, the connection between this Maimir and uh, Pasha's Peshalach, which um, <clears throat> is next week, is because in Pasha's Peshalach you have the first of several accounts of Mon, the first of two accounts of Mon, the second one being in Pasha's Baal Loischa. So since the Torah describes at length that the Jewish people got Mon, and the mon was given on Friday in Lecha Mishnah, the Alter Rebbe in Teireh Eid has this maimed about Lecha Mishnah. Now, as this maimed unfolds, you will see that this maimed has three basic messages. And they're going to be three classes, class one, class two, class three, at least that's the plan at the moment. The three basic messages are food in general, the mon in particular, and Shabbos. And the... The underlying issue, mystically, that's going to be explored, which is going to set up, which is going to be the prelude to the answer to the question we just read, which is going to be literally a couple of lines at the end of the Maimir, is that the, the Alter Rebbe finds it very curious that Mon has everything to do with Shabbos, right? The Chazal tell us, I think it actually brings it in Chumash, Vayivarach, Vayikadesh, Barchai Bimon, and Kitshe Bimon. Mon has a very strong connection to Shabbos. The food, lechem and hashamayim, the heavenly bread that the Jewish people ate, has to do with Shabbos. It was blessed from Shabbos and sanctified from Shabbos. And on Shabbos there was no mon. And this maimed is going to explore that. So we're going to have three conversations. One about food in general. Of course, the mysticism of food. The second is lechem min hashamayim, how we understand heavenly bread. And finally, Shabbos. And how Shabbos is higher than both. Lechem in HaShamayim and Lechem in HaAretz. That is, in very short, the agenda for this Maimir, which we intend in Mitzvah Hashem to teach in three classes. Now, what I intend on doing is this. I'm going to read the questions. I read one question. I'm going to read several more questions rather quickly. And in Mitzvah Hashem, when we do the third class, and we revisit, I think it's the third class, and we revisit this material, we'll have time then to... Um, to analyze the questions a little bit better. But our intent is, no, I'm sorry, it's a second class. The second class is going to deal with some of the questions we're about to have. But for today, we're just going to read and translate the questions and move on. So first of all, we ask the question, why is it that according to Nigla, the two loaves of bread of Lecha Mishnah are one on top of the next, and according to Nister, the two loaves of bread are side by side? So the Rebbe prefaces the answer to this question by prefacing the answer to another question. You must preface first. That when people say grace after meals, when people say benching, and as we all know, benching has four brachas. And the four brachas are divided up into two groups. The first three are called midereiser, biblical brachas. The first one is called birchas hazon, it's about food. The second one is called birchas haaretz, it's a bracha on the land. And the third one is on Yerushalayim. The first three brachas of Shemena Esri, basically, one is for food, one is for Eretz Yisrael, and one is for Yerushalayim. 
So this Maimed asks the following question. That in the second blessing of the Birch HaSamazan, which is supposed to be for the land, it says, Al for the land and for the food. And the question is, when you finish the second brach, you don't simply say, Baruch Atah Hashem Al Ha'aretz. Like the first brach, you say, Baruch Atah Hashem Azon Es Ha'koyel. You mention only Mazain, food. The second brach is Eretz Yisrael. Why do you also mention Mazain? Mevur, but Divir Azal, it says in the Gemara, because Eretz is the Mapke Mazain. Because from earth, food grows, V'tzarech Lahavin, and the question therefore is, Lama Chais Min B'mazain Klal. It may be true that food comes from the earth, but in Bircha Samazin, the first bracha was the bracha where we thanked Hashem for Mazin, for food. So why are we mentioning Mazin again in the second bracha when we say Oretz? And again, the answer to this question and the discussion of this question will be in Mitzvah Hashem next week. Gam Tzadach Lahavan, the third question is, Mashem Mavua B'divri Chazal, says in the Gemara, Al Posek on the Posek, V'yachalto V'savoto U'verachta. You should eat and you should be satisfied and then you will say Bircha Samazin. Zu Bircha Sazon, which goes on the first blessing of benching, which is about food, and the Chazal say, Mesha Tikin, Mesha Rabbeinu, enacted the first Birach of Shmenes. Al Ha'aretz, the second Birach of Shmenes, Zu Bircha Sa'aretz, which is the blessing for the Holy Land, and the Chazal say, Yeshua Tikin, Yeshua enacted the second Birach. And the Toiva, Zu Bircha Zbein Yerushalayim, this goes on Yerushalayim. Now, the relationship between the word Toiva and Yerushalayim is, as the Postuk says, Shenem Barahara Toiva Chuli. And of course, the understanding is that the third Bracha was made by David and Shlemy. And by the way, the last Bracha, which is a Toiva HaMetev, was made much, much later, after the Churban of the second Beis HaMektosh, when they allowed the Arugi Beiter Likove, they added a fourth Bracha, Toiva HaMetev. But the first three brachas, one was made by Moshe, the second was made by Yeshua, the third was made by David and Shleime, and they're all considered biblical, Midirais. So the Rebbe says, Lama, why is it that Birchas Hazon, in the first of these brachas, Ein Maskid in Klau, there is no mention whatsoever, Me'ein Be'ez Brachas or Achrenes, anything which will be mentioned in the second and the third brachas, namely Eretz Yisrael and Yerushalayim. While the Birchas Sa'aris, that in the second blessing, Maskidim Gamkin Allahilas Mazan Vachuli, in the second blessing you make a reference back to the food which you talked about in the first bracha as well. And the Gam is Simon Bon, you finish Allah Rasyala Maz. So in short, there's an inconsistency. The second bracha of Shminasra, I'm sorry, the second bracha of benching includes some of the ideas that are found in the first bracha of benching, but the first bracha of benching has none of the ideas in the second bracha of benching, and the Rebbe wants to understand why. In short, we want to understand the difference between the first bracha of benching and the second bracha of benching. And of course, as you know, I'm great at keeping secrets, so I'm not going to keep a secret. Understand that the first bracha of benching is talking about mozin, but lechem min The second bracha, the first bracha of mes is actually talking about mon, which is, of course, the food Moshe Rabbeinu provided. So in the second bracha, when it speaks about al ha'aretz, al ha'mozin, it's not the same mozin as the first bracha, because the mozin and the second bracha is an allusion to lechem min ha'aretz, the bread which comes from the earth, which is a very, very different type of bread than the bread which is coming lecha min hashamayim, the bread that comes from heaven. But we'll see in Mitzvah Hashem next week all of this. And the Rebbe begins on line 11, Ach lahoven kalan now. But if we want to explore all of the issues that we just raised quickly in the first 10 lines, that with Hashem's help, we're going to revisit in the next couple of classes, it says the Rebbe, yesh la hagdim inyan kavona sachila. It is important that we talk about the meaning, the significance of eating food according to Torah, and particularly the meaning and the idea of eating food according to Pneum Yestad, according to Kabbalah. Al Pasuk, based on the idea that it says in the Pasuk, Ki al kol pi that when a person eats food, it's not only the physicality of the food which is nourishing the physicality of the person, but there's there's this spirituality within the food, and the spirituality within the food is nourishing the spirituality within the person. The meaning of what does it mean? The utterance of Hashem's mouth, so to speak, which is in the food, means that this has to do with the ten utterances of creation. That when Hashem said that grass should grow, so he created the possibility for all of vegetation, for all of agriculture. Who? That statement of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and the life that comes from that statement is HaMachayi gives life to all plants. 
And as a result, the living plant, in addition to being something physical, which can nourish a physical person, also has a godly spark, which is revealed or manifest within that bread. Through a chain reaction of steps, which includes myriads and myriads of points. In other words, it goes lower and lower and lower and lower until spiritual energy becomes the life of physical food. It says in the Chazal, it's not a grass below. It does not have a mazal and it goes higher and higher still. Everything physical comes from things spiritual. And when we're eating food, two things are taking place. The physical food is nourishing the physical biology of the person. And the life within the food is nourishing the life of the human being. And of course, the reason for this question is as follows. The question is, man as well. A man is also a development, comes down from one of the ten utterances of creation. The statement that says, let us make man. So if a plant, a fruit, a grain, a bread, has a physical substance, and it also has a life force within it that comes from the creative power of a Kaddish Baruch Hu when he made them, a human being is the same thing. There's a physical person, and there's also the spiritual life force of the person, which also comes from the ten utterances of creation. And the question, therefore, is, Why does a person need bread? And at the same time, Bread does not need a person. We need to eat bread, because if we don't eat, need bread, God forbid, our life will be discontinued. Even though a human being was created by God, and even though our soul comes from the spirit, of the, ten, of the utterance that said, let us make man. How come bread is different? Bread does not need us to live. And uh, we need bread in order for us to be able to be sustained. Now, of course, bread may not need us to live, but it needs water to live, and it needs carbon to live, and it needs sunlight to live. So it's, everything really is living off everything. But as you know, the rule of thumb is every living being is being nourished by a level of life that's less than itself. We're eating animals and plants, and the plant is eating, in effect, minerals, sunlight, and water, and carbon, which is not organic at all. It's not living at all. So you could really stretch the question. And basically the question is, the highest living things are living from lesser living things. And in each level, each thing is living from something which is on the scale, on the table of living things below it. And the question is, why? Shouldn't it be the other way around? Why are we living from plants and animals, and animals and plants are not living from us, but from things that are less than ourselves? This is the big question. And the Rebbe answers, Ahinei, the answer is, that Pirash Yech Adam, when you say that a human being needs to live from animals and plants. And animals and plants don't need to live from a human being, and we're wondering why. It says, This is not an allusion to the animal soul alone within a person. In other words, perhaps if a human being was only an animal soul, it would not be that important. Because also the animal, gets life from food. But nevertheless, that's not the whole story. But rather, even the godly soul, not only the animal soul, but the godly soul as well, is nourished from the plants and animals that human beings eat. Somehow life is added to the godly soul. Light and life. From the food that one eats. Which is why the word Adam is written with a hey, denoting a very special Adam, that the godly soul needs the food from animals and from plants in order to sustain itself, to keep itself alive, and so on. And the question is why. So Rabbi say, now we're holding on line 19. And here we'll pause. These shiurim are going on for about five years, which is incredible. It really is amazing. And I cannot say enough, and everybody who is enjoying these shiurim should understand that these shiurim are not happening spontaneously. There's a sponsor, and you cannot thank enough 
the Khanen fund and the Khanen family for facilitating these shiurim in, in every imaginable way, and they deserve an incredible yashikoyach, and that's really sincere. And we don't mention it enough times, but it's important that periodically we should remember that the, the spiritual food that you are eating is being nourished by physical food provided by a particular person or group of people. Anyway, having said that, over the course of these years, we've learned quite a few Maimodim. I don't know how many Maimodim we've learned. A hundred, hundred and fifty. We've learned a lot. And there are certain topics which have recurred. There are certain conversations which come up again and again. And frankly, there are certain conversations that they're coming up again and again is a desirable thing. It's good. It's good because we forget. It's also good because each time you hear it a little bit differently. And the discussions, the material is so fundamental. It is so important uh, that you really cannot uh, learn it enough times. And one of those conversations is the conversation about Toyo and Tikkun. And the discussion that we're going to be having now in the text, in other words, the discussion that I rushed through the first 16 lines to get to, is a discussion on Tayo and Tikkun. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to read, I'm going to discuss Tayo and Tikkun, I'm going to introduce Tayo and Tikkun. And when we finish, with the help of God and the mercy of the clock, we'll proceed, we'll learn on, we'll finish this part of the Maimir, but I, I feel that it's good, important that we summarize um, the discussion of Tayo and Tikkun, which we've had many, many times in the past. First, a basic background. And I'm going to use simple language. I'm not going to use holy language. I'm going to use simple language. And perhaps somebody would say that this is uh, not entirely appropriate for the subject matter, but it's easier for me to teach this way and I believe it'd be much easier for you to be able to follow and listen. So I'm affording myself just to explain it to you very directly. Toyo and Tikkun can be seen as two experiments on the world of Atsilas. When you learn Kabbalah, you learn that to Kabbalah, the most important world, the most important plane, the most important reality is Atsilas. In fact, Kabbalah is the world of Atsilas. To Kabbalah, what we're doing down here in this lowest world is simply setting up l'shem yichud kutcha b'richu shchinte, things that are going to transpire in Kabbalah. The Kabbalistic paradigm is everything we do down here is about Atsilas. Now when you learn Hasidus, you learn a very different idea that everything we're doing down here is for down here. And we call it Dira B'tachtoinim. And therefore, Kabbalah and Hasidus are quite different in their end, in their purpose. But according to Kabbalah, Atzilus is not only the most important world. Kabbalah, Atzilus, in fact, is the point of all of creation, according to Kabbalah. Now, what is Atzilus? What makes Atzilus so unique? And why is it that Atzilus is the central point or theme of everything you learn about in Chochmas Kabbalah? And in short, the answer is because Atzilus is a very, very unique place. It is a place which is defined by the concept which we call Gilo Yelikus, the revelation of godliness. And there are two concepts here. The first concept is the concept of godliness, infinite light, Oyer Ein Seif, which is very, very important to Kabbalah. Godliness is not God, but godliness is not the creation either. It's simply an emanation, it's a ha'ora, it's a shine, it's the Abishter's presence being delivered through the medium of light, godliness. But there's a lot of levels of godliness, higher levels of godliness and higher levels of godliness. Still, what's unique about Atzilus is that is called the revelation of godliness. The revelation of godliness means that since Atzilus has vessels, Caleb, and the vessels of Atzilus are considered other, separate from the light of Atzilus, and when the light of the Atsilas shines into the vessels of Atsilas, the vessels of Atsilas reveal the light of Atsilas. This creates the first place where godliness achieves an idea which is called revelation. Godliness achieves Giloy El being revealed to another. This is incredibly, incredibly important to 
Kabbalah and Hasidus, because once we have one concept of godliness reaching another, in other words, once you have one place, one world, where Oyer, where godliness is shining on something which is by itself not godliness, it sets up the idea that in the end, safe call safe, godliness should be able to be revealed down here in the physical world as well. So Atzilus is the place of Gili Elikus, godliness being revealed to another, and all of Kabbalah is about this idea of godliness being revealed to another. Higher than Atzilus, the godly light is so strong that the vessels are obliterated, the vessels are bittled, they're nullified, so there's no other. Lower than Atzilus, the vessels are so powerful that they hide the light, and in effect, there is no revelation of godliness. Atzilus is the perfect world where the light of Atzilus meets the vessels of Atzilus, and neither is able to eliminate the other. The light does not bittle the vessels, and the vessel does not hide the light. And as a result of this, you have Gilo Yelakus El Azulas, the light of God that is shining unto a, another, namely the vessel. <coughs> but when the Abishak Vayachal made Atzilus, there were two drafts, there were two efforts. The first Atzilus is called Tayu. And that Atzilus, that revelation of God that is had a shvira, shattered. So then we had a second version of Atzilus, a second draft of Atzilus, which is called Tikkun. And as I've explained to you so many times in the past, it's not Kvayocha that HaKadosh Baruch God forbid, made a mistake. It's Boin al Menas Liste, Hashem created Elam Atayu with the understanding that it would be destroyed. And Seis al Menas Livne, the Abish destroyed Elam Atayu in order for there to be Elam Atikun. So Toyo and Tikkun share one basic criteria. It's light being revealed to a vessel in a state of revelation. But Toyo doesn't work out, and Tikkun does work out. And when we talk about why, why did Toyo not work out? And why did Tikkun yes work out? There are two ideas that are brought as a standard, as a normal uh, discussion. And there is a third idea which is usually between the lines, hidden between the lines, that's really more important than the first two ideas. And this third idea is discussed in the mind that we have in front of us as well. And what I want to do right now is I want to talk you through these three ideas. Why is it that Tayhu is not sustained? Why is it that the first version of Elam Atzilas, Gili Elakos and the level of Elam Atayu, not sustainable, why does it shatter? And why is it that Gilea Lukus to Azulas in Elamatikan, which is the second version of Elamatilas, is sustainable and it exists and it's 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 real even now. So the first difference between Elamatayo and Elamatikun is that Elamatayo is called Eiris Merubim. And Elamatikun is called Eiris Muatim. Atsilas version one has a lot of light, and Atsilas version two has less light. Now you need to understand that that's very problematic because we're talking about Ein Saf. We're talking about Ein Saf, infinite light, godliness. And every person understands very obviously that the moment you're discussing godliness, you cannot speak of commas. You can't speak of quantity. You can't say that this is more and this is less. If it's infinite, it's infinite. If it's not infinite, it's not infinite. There's no more or less when you're talking about infinity. And yet, when we talk about the difference, the first difference, between Elam Atayu and Elam Atikun, <coughs> we say Elam Atayu is Eireis Merub, and there was a lot of light of Ein Sof. And Elam Atikun is Eireis Muatim, there's very little light of Ein Sof. If we're dealing with Ein Sof, it should not be able to be measured in more or less. Its quality is infinity, and every drop is absolutely infinite, and therefore they should be identical. That's the obvious question. And the answer, in short, is, and I'm going to give you Hebrew words, that... Eila Matayu is called Gilui Muhus Ha'etzem of Ein Sof. And Eila Matikun is called Gilui Muhus Ha'ora of Ein Sof. So I said uh, four words, right? I said Gilui in both. I said Muhus in both. I said Ein Sof in both. But the difference is that in Tayu it's Gili Mahus of the Etzim of Ein Sof. And in Tikkun, I said it's the Gili the Mahus of the Ha'ada of Ein Sof. Now the word Gili I touched on. I explained to you what Gili means. Gili means revelation to another. 
I'm talking to you. If you don't understand what I'm saying, I'm wasting my time and I'm wasting your time and I'm revealing nothing. Because revelation is not defined by my talking. My revelation is defined by you being able to appreciate what I'm saying, understanding it, and processing it, internalizing it, and so on. So gilui means reveal to another. The word mahus means in short that in atzilus you actually experience the Ein Sof. The opposite of the word mahus would be the word mitzias. And mitzias would mean that you have proof of godliness and you don't have the experience of godliness. And mahus means not only is there proof of godliness, there's actually the experience, there's the feel of what, so to speak, what godliness feels like. So in both drafts of Atzilus, whether we're talking about Tehu and Tikkun, it's Giloi of Mahus, which means that there's actually experience of Ein Sof. And without giving you any conversations beyond a few words, the mushal, the metaphor for Mahus is Tainug. You're experiencing the delight of godliness, the, the Tainug of Alakuz. And in both Tayu and Tikkun, we're dealing with Ein Sof. The difference is only this. In Tayu, it's the Giloi Mahus of the Etzim of Ein Sof. And in Tikkun, it's the gilui of the mahus of the ha'ara of the aids of. And what's the difference? I'm going to try and explain this. I, I don't want to lose you, but I do want to try and explain this. Hasidus talks about light. And on a simple level, it means physical light. But the definitions in Hasidus for light are quite different than what we understand light to be simply in the physical sense of the word uh, as we understand it plainly. And explain to you what I mean that's relevant to us. If you have white light, you have one uniform light that has hidden within itself every uh, wavelength, every color in the rainbow. You have longer wavelengths which are closer to red than shorter wavelengths which go to the blue and so on. But in white light you see neither short nor long wavelengths, you see only white. When the white light is somehow divided, it splits up and becomes a rainbow. According to Hasidus, white light and colored light are actually two levels within light. Light is seen as being two planes. The higher plane is the whiteness of the light. And the whiteness of the light is called in Hebrew, Oyer HaOyel Al Kulana, the transcendent light, the light that unifies. The second layer would be the colors, the blue, the red, the yellow, the green, the orange, and so on. And according to Hasidus, white light is not simply a mixing together of various colors, but it's a transcendent level, a higher level that is above the individual colors and that unifies the individual colors. In other words, when you're looking at white light according to Hasidus, you're actually looking at two things in the very same space. You're seeing all color, but how all color is enveloped, is swallowed up, is bittled by the whiteness of the white light and all you see is the white light. And when white light becomes a rainbow, again according to Hasidus, there's a split. And the split means that the white light, which is called in Hebrew again, the transcendent light is removed. And by the transcendent light being removed, uh, the colors emerge, the colors separate. So here's where it gets tricky, okay? White light is a metaphor for Ein Saf, because it includes all color. Individual colors of the rainbow are a metaphor for the ten sphetus. Blue would be chesed, for example. Red would be gvura, for example. I don't even know if this is true, but something to that effect. But here's the tricky part. The tricky part is as follows. Colors of light is in Bria, not in Atzilas. Because in the world of Bria, there is no Ein Saf. There is only colors. There's only limited sphetis, which is called in Hebrew, er neshama. In chesed, you'll have only chesed. In gavur, you'll have only gavur, and so on. See, but atzilus is a bit of a complexity, because atzilus is two things. Atzilus has ten vessels, and each vessel accounts for a different sphera, 
chesed, gevura, and so on, which means blue and red and so on. But in Atsilas, there's also a gili of Ein Saf. Godliness is shining through the vessels of Atsilas. So the world of Atsilas is, from the vessel's perspective, individual colors. From the light's perspective, white. Because each vessel receives from the white light one aspect, one color, which is the equivalent of one sphera. And by the virtue of having that one color, having that one sphera, through the individual color which that vessel relates to, it's connected to the whiteness of the light. I'm trying to describe something which physically does not exist. But if you could imagine this, if you could use your imagination, yeah. What we know is either white light or colored light. White light doesn't allow you to see the colors. Individual colors of the rainbow means the whiteness of the light has been eliminated. If you could imagine something in between those two, in between those two means, on the one hand, you have individual colors, and on the other hand, those individual colors are not canceling the white light, but rather through the individual colors, the whiteness of the light is being presented. So if you wanted to understand this, uh, in Atzilas, this is how you would understand it. The Ein Saf of Atzilas goes into Chesed. Chesed is, for example, the color blue. So the blue within the white light of Ein Saf invests itself in the vessel of Chesed. The rest of the white light doesn't go away. It hovers, it remains above. So chesed of Atzilus is chesed on the one hand and ein sof on the other. The ein sof, which is a, in the metaphor is white light, goes into the vessel of Gavura, which let's say for the sake of argument is the color red. But when the red aspect within the light goes into the vessel of Gavura, the rest of the light does not disappear. It hovers. It remains there indirectly. So as a result, on the one hand, Gevura of Atzilus is Gevura. On the other hand, Gevura of Atzilus is Ein Sof. In other words, what I'm trying to get you to visualize, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to disagree that I'm asking you to do something which is quite difficult to do, is to see light in three levels. The lowest level of light is its only colors. And from a mystical perspective, that's Briya. The other extreme is where it's only white light. And from a mystical perspective, that's Ein Sof. Between those two is Atzilus. And Atzilus is, if you will, a partial division of the light. On the one hand, the light is Sphiris, it's meeting a vessel. Because the aspect of the light which is related to the vessel is going into the vessel. The blue within light is attracted to the vessel of Chesed. The red within light is attracted to the vessel of Gevura. But it's not that the rest of the light departs, but rather the rest of the light is there in an indirect way. And it's revealed also through the Midah, through the Sphid. In other words, the Chesed within the Gili Ein Saf and Atzilus is the intermediate through which the Ein Saf reveals itself in Midas HaChesed of Atzilus. The Gevura, which is in the vessel of Gevura and Atzilus, is the medium through which the Ein Saf reveals itself to the Midah of Gevura of Atzilus. In other words, what I'm trying to get you to contemplate is a partial division of light. Light is divided enough for there to be colors, but light is not divided so much that you have only colors. Each color is bringing with itself the oir ha'il al-kulana, the transcendent light, which is a muscle for Ein Saf, which is the whiteness of the light. Now, if you're able to wrap your mind around what I just said, you can understand a little bit be the difference between Tayu and Tikkun. If you remember, Tayo and Tikkun are both Atzilus. Atzilus means Gili of Ein Saf. And again, the, the words that are standards for both, Giloi Mohos of Ein Saf. But the difference is that the first Atzilus is Tayu, is Elma Tayu, is Giloi Mohos Etzem of Ein Saf. The second version of Atzilus is Tikkun, is Giloi Mohos Ha'ara of Ein Saf. What's the difference between those two? The difference between those two is what I just described. In Eilam Tayhu, the light of Tayhu does not have this partial division. The Ein Sof, which goes into the vessels of Eilam Tayhu, doesn't have the idea that the Sphira in the Oed is going into the vessel. The Ein Sof itself is going into the vessel. In other words, as if you were to say the white light itself is going into the Keli of Chesed and the Keli of Gevura. In Atzilus version 2, in Elam Atikun, there is, so to speak, a partial division of the Ein Sof, so that the light of Ein Sof, 
which goes into the kalim of atzilus, are sfides. In other words, the, the, the color associated with each keli is what enters into that keli, and through it, the Ein Sof, the Eda El Al is also available to the keli. And that really is the idea, that's the meaning of that statement, that the first difference between Elam Atayhu and Elam Atikun is, Elam Atayhu is Edes Merubim, a lot of light, and Elam Atikun is Edes Motem, is a little light. And recall that I explained to you before that there really, there couldn't be that difference. Because if we're talking about Ein Sof, there can't be more and less than Ein Sof. It's either Ein Sof or not Ein Sof. But what I just described explains at least a little bit the difference between the two. In Elam Atayhu, Oyres Merubi means that the Ein Sof is eagle. The Ein Sof is not at all accommodating the fact that it has to go into a vessel. In Elam Atikun, the Ein Sof is still Ein Sof, but it's accommodating the fact that it has to go into a vessel in as much that it's, so to speak, partially dividing. The Sfira within the oil, the Midas HaChesed, the Midas HaGavur is going into the Kli, and through that, the Ein Sof is available to the Keli indirectly. And it, it, the, the difference is obvious. When you have a light which is supposed to meet a vessel, and the light is infinite and the vessel is finite, as a rule, you have a very bad match. It's not a good shidduch. And if the light makes no accommodation, if the light does not symptom itself at all, that's tehu. When the light makes at least enough of accommodation that there could be a ha'ara of Ein Sof rather than the etzim of Ein Sof so that the sfira within the Ein Sof could go into the kli and through it, the Ein Sof of the Ein Sof is available to the keli indirectly, that's called tikkun. In other words, the difference between Atzilas version 1 and Atzilas version 2, Elamateu and Elamatikin, is not quantity, it's quality. When you say Elamateu has a lot of light, you don't mean a lot of light. You have light on the level of a lot. The light is ain't soft and it's not at all accommodating the vessels that it's going into. In Elamatikin, when you say it's a little light, you don't mean that the light is little. In quantity, you mean that the light is making itself available to a vessel which is, so to speak, little. This is the first difference between Elam Ateu and Elam Atik. Now, I hope that was clear. And if it wasn't, there will be a, an outcry of outrage. What am I talking about? And why am I confusing everybody? And uh, we'll deal with that <laughs> when the letters come in. But I'm going to move on to the second difference. Now we got to the second difference between Elam Ateu and Elam Atik. And that's the vessels, the keli. Elam Atayu is called Kelim Uwatim. The vessels are small. And Elam Atikun is called Kelim Merubim. The vessels are great. In other words, exactly what we said about the light backwards. When it came to the light, we said Elam Atayu is Eides Merubim. And Elam Atikun is Eides Muwatim. And when it comes to the vessels, we said the other way around. Elam Atayu is Kelim Uwatim. The vessels are small. And Elam Atikun, the Kelim Merubim, the vessels are large. And here also, what it sounds like and what it is are very, very different. Because to be sure, it's actually the other way around. When you say Elam Atayu is small vessels, you mean actually very large vessels. And when you say that Elam Atikun is very large vessels, you actually mean very small vessels. But many of them. Uh, I'm going to give you a physical example. Uh, one of the things which intrigues biologists, and believe me, I'm no biologist, I'm no expert, but I did read about this, is how come cells are so small? Every living organism is made up of many, many, many cells. And cells are tiny. And a living thing is made up of many, many, many little cells rather than a few larger cells. There are, from what I understand, examples of very, very large cells in biology, but few and far between. As a rule, uh, in, 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 in nature, in Chochmas Ateva, in biology, amongst living things, a living creature is made up of many, many, many smaller cells rather than a few larger cells. And there's a lot of reasons that explain why it's preferred to have many more cells over a few larger cells. Having said that, now I'm going to just use that simple prelude to go back to Elmatei and Elmatei. Elmatei has very large vessels but very few of them. It's like gigantic cells. Olam Atikun has many, many, many cells. Each one is very, very small. Altogether, they add up to an enormous amount. 
In other words, in Eilam Atayu, when it says Eilam Atayu is Kelim, Uwatim, Uwatim doesn't mean small, it means few. The vessels of Tayu are gigantic, but simple. And when you say about Eilam Atikun, that Kelim Erubim, many vessels, many doesn't mean large, the vessels are very, very small actually, but there's many, many teeny tiny little ones. And I'll explain to you the difference. If you have fewer vessels, what does that mean? You have less variety. Less variety means that each individual vessel is far different than any other vessel. If you have many, 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 many more vessels, that means that the vessels have to share certain characteristics, because otherwise you couldn't account for many. So if you have many vessels, that means that each vessel is different than the other vessels to a far lesser degree. Now let's explain this in plain words, okay? Elam Atayu has ten vessels. One vessel is chesed. Only chesed. Another vessel is gevura. Only gevura. So it's a, it's a cavernous vessel. It's a gigantic vessel. Like one gigantic cell. But it's exclusive to Midas chesed. Now, for the purposes of full disclosure, I will be honest and tell you that it says in Kabbalah and it's brought in Hasidus, that Elam Atayu is actually ten times ten. That means chesed of Tayu does have one time a division into ten. So you have Chochmah of Chesed of Tayu, Bin of Chesed of Tayu, Chesed of Chesed of Tayu, and Gavur of Chesed of Tayu, and so on. So there is a little bit of division, a little bit of verse in Elam Atayu. But as a rule, Elam Atayu has gigantic vessels that are very, very simple. Only Chesed. So what happens when you have a vessel which is only chesed? So the light that enters into this vessel will express the light of Ein Sof, an infinite force, through what is exclusively kindness, only kindness. On the other hand, if you have one gigantic vessel, which is Gevura, so the light of Elam which is Ein Sof, will reveal itself in the vessel of Gevura in a way that will produce an infinite force of Gevura, and only Gevura. What happens as a result is, as I always describe it, you have a reality where each Midah, each Svira is infinite. And each Svira, each Midah is completely intolerant of any other Midah and Svira. It's what I call a world of poles, extremes. Chesed is Chesed only. There's no Gevura. Gevura is Gevura only. There's only Chesed. So Kelim Watim doesn't mean small vessels. It means large vessels, but few of them. And by the virtue of the fact that there's few vessels, but very, very large ones, that means each vessel is expressing the light in a raw, extreme, simple, polar way. And there's no integration, there's no iskalos, there's no sharing from one meter to the other meter. That's the second characteristic of Elam Atayu, that the light, which is called a gili of the etzim of Ein Sof, etzim huz of Ein Sof, which means a light which is not at all accommodating the vessel, is shining into a vessel which is exclusively chesed, and produces an infinity of chesed. What happens in this world when you bring down an infinity of chesed? It will destroy it. On the other hand, if you have a light of Elam Atayu, which goes into a vessel of Gevura, what's it going to produce? An infinity of Gevura. That will certainly destroy the world. And as it's explained in Kabbalah and Hasidus, the Midas of Elam Atayu cancel each other. Each Mida is so extreme, there's absolutely no room for more than one Mida at a time. <clears throat> and as a consequence, when chesed is done, gevura destroys it. And when gevura is done, tefedes destroys it. There's no integration, there's no sharing, because everything is extreme. For the two reasons that I just enumerated. Number one, <coughs> edes merubim, the light of teyu is the etzim of ein sof, or the mahusah ada of ein sof. And number two, because the vessels are muatim, there's very few of them, and each one is very, very large. Now moving on to elamat tikkun. The second aspect of Elam Atikun is what's called Kelim Merubim. Kelim Merubim means a lot of little vessels. Just like in biology, a body is made up of a lot of tiny cells. And little vessels, what does that mean? That, for example, Chesed. Chesed has Chesed, Sheba Chesed, Sheba Chesed, Sheba Chesed, at least, till the above, at least five times. Which means that you can have Gevura, Sheba Chesed, Sheba Chesed, Sheba Chesed, and Teferis, Sheba Chesed, Sheba Chesed, Sheba Chesed, and on and on and on which means you have an incredible variety of kelim, and each keli has a relatedness to every other keli. Chesed and Gevura share, because you have Gevura within Chesed, you have Chesed within Gevura, 
And as a result, two things are true. Number one, when the light of Ein Saf goes into the vessel of Chesed and Elam Atikun, Chesed of Tikun is not going to be polar, it's not going to be extreme. It's not going to be extreme because in Chesed of Tikun there's already Gvura. When the light of Ein Saf is going to go into the Keli of Gvura, it's not going to be extreme because in the Keli of Gvura you have already Chesed. But then there's another difference. And the other difference is even more meaningful. And the other difference is that it's not either or. You can't either be chesed or gavura, you can have both together. Since chesed is not extreme, since gavura is not extreme, there's a concept called hiskalalus, interconnectedness, integration, unification, oneness. And of course, the, the, the ideal word in Chochmas HaKabola to describe this is the word takatikon, correction. Properness, order. Proper orientation, where you have together chesed and gavura. Chesed allows for gavura, gavura allows for chesed, because within chesed is already gavura, within gavura there's already chesed, and the gavura within chesed and the chesed within gavura allow chesed and gavura to cohabit. And that's the second difference between Elam and Elam The first difference, again, is that Elam is Eiris Merubim, which means that the light is on a level of eagle. And Elam Atikun is Eiris Mu'atim, which means that the light is on a level of Yoishet, it actually goes into the vessel. And the second difference is that Elam Atayhu is Kele Mu'atim, that means a few very large vessels, which results that when the light goes into the vessel, each one goes to its extreme. And there's no balance, and there's certainly no mutual coexistence. In Elam Atayu, there's Eiris Merubim, there's many smaller vessels, and therefore each Mida has within itself the other Mida, and as a result, not only does each Mida allow for the other Mida, they actually coexist. Those are the two differences between Tayu and Tikkun that everybody knows, that are written in many of the Maimorim. But there's a third difference, and I want to emphasize this third difference, because this third difference is discussed here in our Maimir, and um, what I'm going to share with you is not from Taita Eid, it's from later my modem. Because I believe that what I'm going to share with you is a little bit different than the way it's written here in the Maimir. Perhaps it's a Mishnah Chren, it's a little bit deeper. And I want to emphasize this, because I think this is very, very, very important. So far, we talked about two differences between El Mateo and El Matikan. The difference in the Eid and the difference in the Keli. The third difference is not in what you see. It's not in their body, it's not in their form, it's not in their expression, it's not in their definition. It's in their purpose. And this third difference is the word ma, memhe, two letters, ma. Ma, which as you know, has the numerical equivalent of 45, which is the same as the word adam, which means a man, a mensch. And Adam means Tikkun. Adam is the second version of Atzilus, where you have Eres Muwatim and Kele Merubim, and you have a Hiskalalus, an interconnection of parts. The real difference between Elam Atehu and Elam Atikun isn't that Elam Atehu's light is too strong and Elam Atikun's light are weaker. It isn't that Elam Atehu's vessels are a few very large vessels, and Elam Atikun is many. Smaller vessels, the real difference is that Elam Atikun has what we would call in the Chabad culture, the Kavana, the purpose. And the Kavana is Ma. And Ma basically means Bittl. Bittl means a sense of dedication to HaKadosh Baruch To Hashem, to the purpose of creation. And I'll try to illustrate the difference between a world with Ma and a world without Ma to the best of my limited abilities. Okay, let's talk about the physical world. On this physical world, there are very smart people, very intelligent people. Some of these intelligent people are servants of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. They learn Teda, they do mitzvahs. Some of these people, Lahavdal, are using their intelligence to learn other chachmas. They're not exactly enamored with Teda and mitzvahs. They're busy with other things. Why are some predisposed or in fact engaged in, in a, in a, in a worldview, an intellectual priority, and a lifestyle that reflects not Teda Mitzvahs. And others 
who are also intelligent, are using their intelligence to have a deep understanding of Tayyid and Mitzvahs, and a dedication to the divine purpose, and dedication to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and so on. So the simple answer is their intellect, their intelligence. One person's mind leads him to understand that this way of life is correct, and this priority is true. And the other person's intelligence tells him the opposite. Very, very smart people explore what other people let others decide for them. Right? Many people let others tell them what to think and feel. The smartest amongst us judge everything for themselves. They, they um, re-ask the questions that have been asked for centuries and millennia, come up with their own answers. And on that basis, they choose a what they consider to be important and real, and that's what they dedicate their lives to. And Lahavdul, some people's intelligence gets them to understand that Chochmas Chitzoni is that a secular value system has credibility. And Lahavdul, other people's great intelligence leads them to understand that Torah is Emes. And if I may insert here, and I've told this to you in the past, there's actually a Aral Bag who writes. I saw it once. I was giving a Parsha class. <clears throat> and I wish I could find it, because it's really a compelling in Al-Bagh, that al Bag says, why are there so many atheists? Why are there so many intellectuals who are secular? And the answer is, because there's so many people who are not that smart. They're smart, but not smart enough. Meaning to say, they're intelligent enough to have their own positions on things, but they're not intelligent enough to have their intellect lead them to HaKadosh Baruch So if you think about it, what's the difference between a person whose intelligence leads him in one direction and his intelligence leads him in the opposite direction. The answer is what they understand, what their mind tells them, what their ego tells them. But there's another possibility. There's another very distinct possibility. And the other possibility is that a Jew has an neshama. And the neshama knows that Torah is true and that God is true. Not because he or she is intellectually convinced but because they know it from the inside. They know it from what we call their essence. Such a person could be as intelligent or more intelligent than the great intellectuals who are arguing and debating what truth is. But their frame of reference, the basis for how they know what truth is, is not their intellect, it's not their mind. It's their soul. It's their inner core that's telling them this is emes or this is from the core and this is sheker, which means this really has no core. So what I'm trying to describe to you is that you don't have two types of people, you have three. You have one type of person whose ego leads him in the direction of chokhmas chitzenias. You have a second type of person whose ego and his mind leads him to kedusha, And then you have a person whose soul leads him to kedusha. The soul can be qualified, can be enriched, can be proven based on his superior intelligence, but his relationship to Torah and to HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not his intellect, his relationship to HaKadosh Baruch Hu is his neshama. And that's the third difference between Tayo and Tikkun. Tayo and Tikkun are very holy worlds. In Elam HaTayu, there are no secular people. <laughs> Elam HaTayu is not a world that's going to consider the option of there not being a God. Tayo is too smart for that. In Elam Atayu, there is a clear understanding of Ein Eid Milvadeh, there's nothing but God. And in Elam Atikun, there's also a clear understanding that there's nothing but God. But Elam Atayu knows Ein Eid Milvadeh because he's so smart. Because he's Ein Saf. And the Ein Saf of Elam Atayu compels Elam Atayu to the service of HaKadosh Baruch Hu for lack of words based on his ego. In Elam Atikun, there's a property which Terry doesn't know. And that's Ma. Olam Atikun is quieter, is less extreme, is much more balanced than Olam Atayu. But there's another component. In Olam Atikun, the real engine that drives Tikkun's connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not because his infinite intellect helps him understand HaKadosh Baruch Hu. His infinite midas help him feel HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but because there's an emergence of Ma. Beneath the Eris and Kalim of Atzilus, beneath the form and the expression and the infinity and the ego and the richness of Elam Atzilus, there is a very, very deep sense of the truth of Hashem, of God. And that inner truth of Hashem is called Ma. And that's the real basis for why Elam is Elam In other words, 
frequently, when you have the conversation about Eilam Ateu and Eilam Atikun, you only talk about the two differences that I mentioned first. Eilam Ateu is Eilam Merubim, Eilam Atikun is Eilam Muatim. Eilam Ateu is Kelim Muatim, and Eilam Atikun is Kelim Merubim. But those are the external differences. The real difference is Eilam Ateu is a world who's driven to have a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu because of its drive, because of its ego. Eilam Atikun is driven to have a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu because it senses HaKadosh Baruch Hu underneath itself. And that's why you say in the Pasach El Yaha, the Ihu Sheima, the Ihu Eirach Asilas, the real secret of Atzilas, of Tikkun is Ma. And the real, real difference between El Amateu and El Amatikun is not how much light there is, or how much vessel there is, not what kind of relationship there is between light and vessels, not kind of what kind of relationship there is between a vessel and a vessel, but what are you? El Amateu is defined by its greatness. El Amatikun is defined by its bittle, by its sense of God. Or to use a philosophical term, El Amatikun is described by its depth, and El Amateu is described by its greatness. And that's why Elam Ateyu is an Atsilas which is unsustained, it has a Shvira. And Elam Atikun is an Atsilas which is sustained, which has a Tikun and a Kiyu. So I took you on a trip. If you were able to travel with me from the beginning until the end, I'm happy. <laughs> and I hope you're happy also. But um, whatever you got from the discussion that we had for the last, I don't know what it is, 35 minutes, the summary of what I shared with you is that people who have learned Hasidus are familiar with the two big differences between Tayu and Tikkun. The Tayu is more light and Tikkun is less light. Tayu is fewer vessels and Tikkun is greater vessels. But what's often lost on people is that the real difference is the third. Elam Tikkun is a world where the world senses its creator and its dedication to what the creator wants. And when you dedicate what the creator wants, automatically you cooperate. You don't think about what you want, you think about what the Creator wants. So Chesed does not think about Chesed, it thinks about HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And if Chesed, if HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants, God Almighty wants, that Chesed and Gvura should join, they join. In Elam Atayu, there's also a very deep dedication to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But it's a dedication to HaKadosh Baruch Hu based on its power, on its greatness. And therefore, Chesed loves HaKadosh Baruch Hu as only Chesed can, but there's no room for fear of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Gvura love, fears HaKadosh Baruch Hu as only Gvura can, but there's no room for love because they're in effect competing for their relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu because their relationship is based on what they are as opposed to being based on a sense of HaKadosh Baruch Hu which is beneath them. And that's the real reason. Elo Mateo has a Shvir and Elo Matikin doesn't have a Shvir. Now we're going to begin to learn the Maimir now. It makes Hashem. We're on line 19. But I want to say one more thing. And the last thing that I want to share is a bit problematic because I'm not sure that this Maimir says what I'm going to say. My source is at least the Hemshech Hayim Beis. For those who are not aware, in the first section of Hayim Beis, there's over 200 pages on Tayu and Tikkun. In fact, in Hecholzu and Ranat, there's a footnote from the Rebbe. The Ranat, Hecholzu, talks about Tayu and Tikkun, amongst other things. And there's one of the footnotes where the Rebbe mentions that in Ayim Beis, there's an explanation on Tayu and Tikkun, which is extraordinary. The Rebbe, who's so careful with words, is mafli, uses a word to denote how extraordinary is the discussion of Tayu and Tikkun in the first Chalik of Ayim Beis. All the ideas I shared with you are there at great, great length. But very importantly, this ma idea that I'm emphasizing is discussed there at length. And there's one more detail. And that one more detail is that according to Kabbalah, ma is in the keli, not in the yair. The idea that you sensed your creator and therefore serve him, not because of how much you understand him and feel him, but because you sense him, is in the vessel more than in the light. Just like we say in the physical world that the body, as low as it is, has a higher source than the neshama. In Atzilus, we say the vessel has a higher source than the light. How do we see manifest the higher source of the vessel than the light? And the answer is ma. The bitl of ma, the idea that you sense your creator and you dedicate to what he wants, is in the vessel and not in the light. 
And this is another way of describing the difference between Tayyu and Tikkun. In Elam Atayu, the Bittl is from the Oyer. The light is dictating to Elam Atayu how it's going to have a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch. And in light, there is no Ma. In Elam Atikun, the vessel, the Keli dictates how you can have a relationship with Ebishter. And in the Keli, there is Ma. And because of the Ma, which is in the Keli, Elam Atikun has the Tikun that it has. And because of the lack of Ma, Elam Atayu has the Shvira that it has. But this last thing that I just mentioned, that the ma is in the vessel and not in the oir, it's written in later my Mori Hasidis. I'm not sure that the Alter Rebbe is going to explain it this way. So we'll learn this moment as the Alter Rebbe explains it here. But bear in mind what I'm telling you, and again, what I'm telling you is written in later my Mori Hasidis, and L'cha'era, the later Mori Hasidis are a Mishnah Chreina. They're actually going deeper and they're clarifying what's written in the Maimorim from the earlier Rabbeim. So in Elam Atikun, there is Eidus Muatim, that's number one. This Kalim Erubim, there is number two. There is the Ma, the sense of the Creator, which is number three. And then there is this idea that the Ma is from the Keli and not from the Eid. So after all of this talking, let's learn some Hasidus. Line 19, Vayum. In answering all of the questions that we had above, and specifically the question of why we need food, Says Rabbi Behagdam Tchila, let's preface first, Shaydish Inyan Tayyu and Tikkun. The idea of the two worlds, of Tayyu and Tikkun, as I explained to you before, Tayyu is Atsilas, and Tikkun is Atsilas. And the meaning of the word Atsilas is Gili of Eidein Saf. It's only that an Elam Atayu is a Gili of the Mahus of the Etzam of Ein Saf. And in Tikkun, it's the Gili of the Mahus of the Ha'ara of the Ein Saf. And therefore, Elam Atayu is unsustainable, and Elam Atikkun is sustainable. Says the Rebbe, ki tikun. Adam, the concept of man, and as a result, the concept of physical humanity comes from the world of Tikkun. And I explain to you why. What is the characteristic of a human being, of Adam, that he has a center, and his center is called Ma, a dedication to a purpose, and that he's integrated. He's not only kind, he's not only severe and exact, he's not only compassionate, he's all three meters together. Ki Adam begematri yeshem ma. Adam, the word Adam, which means man. Man is the numerical equivalent of ma, which is 45. Shehu yeshem ma ha-chadash. This is the new concept of ma, whatever that means. And it's discussed, like I said, at length in the first chalik of Ayim Be'ez. Shehu ikir atikim, which is the basis for the order of Elam Atikim. A human being is unique in that he has kala palam kulam. A human being has every single emotion within himself. And not only does he have every single emotion within himself, every emotion that a human being experiences, he experiences in a temperate way. The kindness has some severity. The severity has some kindness. And the Rebbe continues, while v'shedesh behemes v'chayes, domestic and wild animals, heime b'chines tehu, they come from the world of tehu, which is also an atzilus, but a polar and an extreme atzilus, she'kodam l'tikon, which precedes the world of tikon. And I'll just add an interesting idea, which is brought in Hasidus actually. When they measure the strength of animals, they measure the strength of animals based on their weight. Because animals, of course, are heavier or lighter. And when you measure the strength of an animal pound for pound, by far, by far, the weakest creation in the world is a human being. Pound for pound, we're weaker than any animal on earth. And I, I don't like the inference that a human being is another kind of an animal. Human beings are altogether different. They're in the image of God. But I'm using this form to make this point. And Hasidus asks why. <clears throat> why is it that human beings are pound for pound so weak? And the answer is because their intelligence weakens them. Their mind weakens them. What does intellect have to do with weakening a person? It's very, very simple. Physical strength has an awful lot to do with will. And will requires simplicity. To want something very, very much... You can't be complicated. Because when you complicate things, every will has multiple components. And the more components you throw into a will, the less concentrated, less intense is the will itself. So animals are simple. And because they're simple, the wills are very urgent. And this shows itself in their physical strength. Human beings are complex. Every emotion that a person feels is a mixture of a variety of emotions. So their will is never that urgent. Their will is never that simple. And because their will is tempered, their will is controlled, their will is limited, their physical strength, which is a, lim a symptom of their will, is limited as well. 
Because a human being is Adam. Adam means every single thing that we do has within itself a variety of different contributing aspects. Says the Rebbe V'Shedish HaDavaru. If you really want to get at the root of what separates Elam which is a polar world of Gilea Lukus, and Elam which is a integrated and grounded world of Gilea Lukus, you must understand the following. Hina Yeduit is known, Shabrinas Tehu. The world of Tehu, which is a Lukus in the state of Gilead, that's to Ktsovis, that's to extremes, who Bechinas Nekudis, their points. Zu Tachazu, one beneath the next. And of course, a point means. One vessel that's gigantic. So chesed is only chesed. One vessel, that, vessel that's gigantic, which means gevurah is only gevurah. And therefore, it's belihis kalalus. There's no integration. There's no interconnectedness. Shekol Each one is a form unto itself. Umizeh. And because, mystically, Elam is a polar world. And as I told you, the polarity of Tayu is because Eireis Merubim. And most importantly, because there's no ma, there's no sense of purpose, there's no sense of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, says the Rebbe, Nasev and Nimshach, it affects and brings down through many steps in the chain reaction of worlds, from cause to cause, ad until, it creates physical things, like domestic animals, and wild animals. We see, in fact, each one has its own nature, and of course the point is not that they have a different nature, but that they have an exclusive nature with only one character trait, or several character traits. This is, of course, a Rambam and Peter Shamishnayis, which is just a couple of words that Hasidus exploits, that they have just a few emotions. If you could take emotions and arrange them from left to right, like you would colors on a rainbow, from extreme cruelty to unsufferable kindness and have every emotion stacked in between those two, animals would have one slice, one section of that cross, of that panorama, of that kaleidoscope, of that wholeness. An eagle is only whatever nesh it is. Compassion, v'shed hu megevudas, an ox is from gevuda, sher nagavacholu, and the aim behem is kalus club is no integration. Every animal has its personality, and its personality has a particular number of tivim of emotions, and he has no capacity for other emotions. Line twenty-seven, v'atam who and the reason why in animals you have such a simplicity, and such a polarity, and like I said to you before, that's actually the basis for their physical strength. Kireishis mitzuyusam, the beginning of their form. Who mebechinas hatayu was from the world of tayu she'ein bahem is scholars. There's no interconnectedness between one mida and the next. V'chol mida him hus bifnei atzma. Each measure, each emotional attribute is by itself. V'kol echad ve'echad and yochel lisbuch haveda. None can tolerate any of the others. And again, all three points of edes merubim, keles muatim, and the lack of ma are consistent with these symptoms, with this outcome. And then he says on line 29, this is the explanation of what says in the end of Pashas Vayishlach. The Rizal says that in Pashas Vayishlach, the very end of the Pasha, you have a lengthy discussion of the genealogy of Esav. His wives and his sons and their children and their grandchildren. And then we move on to Seir, which is a nation of, of Kenanim and their offspring. And then, of course, the assimilation of Esav's family into the family of Seir until... Esav and Edom become inseparable, they become one and the same thing. And amongst the many things described in that lengthy discussion is the kings of Edom. And it says there, one king dies and the other one succeeds him. It's impossible for the formation of a second Sfira. With the absence of and the annihilation of the Sfira that came before. I suppose if you wanted to explain this from a historical perspective, what you would say is that there were no patrilineal dynasties formed in the, di in the kingship of Esau's descendants. A king ruled, he died, and he wasn't replaced by his son who would have a similar character, but somebody altogether different. In other words, there's no continuity. And mystically it means one Mida dies, 
because there's no room for two midas in the same plane. It's either chesed or gevura, it's either gevura or teferis, it's teferis or nesach, and hoid and seid and so on. The akoyl, and the basis for all of this, is mitzad hargoshes haguf. Because each one feels his body. Mehuseh shel kol echad v'echad. The form of each one. U mitzad teke v'argoshes atzmusi. Since each one is aware of himself. Rather than the ma of tikkun, with your aware of HaKadosh Baruch which we described before, and none can tolerate their fellow because Shehu Heipach Muhuseh is the opposite of his form. Just like kindness and exactitude are opposites and neither can tolerate the other and therefore there's no concept of interconnectedness and integration and therefore they shatter. And like I explained to you before, his scholars doesn't only mean that Chesed and Gevura get along. Hiskalus means that in chesed is already gevura, and in gevura there's already chesed, which is the basis for the integration of chesed and gevura. Ah, to such an extent, through many steps of a chain reaction of worlds, step after step, even physical things form, what kind of physical things have character, which is a reflection of Elam where each thing is distinct and polar, in other words, partial, Rather than being integrated in whole, demem is true of all minerals, plants, and animals. Va'akoyl and all this is They lacked a ray of moyach of intelligence. For the hoyabehem bechin is bittel, and they don't have the quality of bittel. Now, Rabbi say, I want you to understand. Here, the Rebbe is going to talk about moichin. I talk to you about ma, and I made it clear that ma is from the keli. The Alter Rebbe is going to talk here about Moichen. And Moichen is not from the Keli. Moichen is from the Yoyer. So what the Alter Rebbe is saying is a bit different than what I told you. And what I told you, again, I believe this is correct, is the Mishnah Chreyn of what's written here. You will learn in Hasidus. There's a Maimir Kairach in Ayin Aleph. And the same Maimir you also have in Aderes. It's part of Hemshchayim Beis. It's the middle of this whole incredible sug of Teo and Tikkun. With Alter Rebbe talks about the word Hiskalalus. And he gives three examples for Hiskalalus. One, which we're going to see later in this moment, in the next shir, I believe, is Hiskalalus where the light is so strong that the differences are obliterated. They're pulverized. The second is where the light is so strong that it weakens them. It doesn't destroy, but weakens them. And because each one is weak, each one tolerates another. And the third is where the Hiskalalus comes from Keli, Ma. This Maimed is talking about Tikkun based on the model of the second Hiskalus, which you have in the later Maimodim. But the later Maimodim see the third Hiskalus, which is called Mebliya Shayim Tadesh Vaseif, a Hiskalus of Ma, which comes from Caleb. In other words, what I said to you before is different than what we're going to learn now, and I don't want to confuse you. So I'm going to, from this point forward, Learn the Maimed as the Maimed is written. I, I told you what says in later my mother about Ma. The important thing you need to know about Ma is that what Ma gives you is a bitl, because Ma means you're not aware of yourself, you're aware of your source and your purpose. In later my mother, we say that Ma is in Kalim. In this Maimed, we say Ma is in Moichin. And the idea, of course, is the moyach shalat ala leiv. The emotions tend to be extreme and polar. And the mind can quiet them. And because the mind can quiet them, by quieting each individual emotion, it's possible for various emotions to coexist. And I'm not going to keep bringing up the contradictions. We're just going to learn this moment as this moment is written. So from this point on, we're going to maintain what we said before. And I'll repeat myself now, okay? Tell you is Eidus Merubim, Kelem Uatam, and no Ma, no Kavona. Tikkun is Eidus Merubim, Kelem Uatam, and has Ma. And as far as we're concerned, at the moment, Ma means the light of Chochma, which quiets each of the individual Midas and affects a Hiskalos. And the Rebbe says on line 35, Avo, Bechines HaTikkun, when we talk about the world of Tikkun. Shobchines Adam, which is the concept of man. And what is the meaning of man? Bechines Patsif, a face. But what is a face? We have the right side of the face, the left side of the face, and the center of the face. There's a radiation of what's called the Numa, as the Havaya is spelled with a fill of Alephs. <clears throat> if, if you spell Hashem's name, Yud Kei you write out the words. 
If you look in Pasach Eliyahu, which is in Siddur, you'll see this. Yud is spelled Yud Vav Dalet. He is He Aleph. Vav is Vav Aleph Vav. And the second He is also He Aleph. So Yud Vav Dalet, He Aleph, Vav Aleph Vav. And He Aleph is 45. There's Yud Le'ela, Yud Le'tata V'yum De'em Tisa. There's a Yud on top. Yud in the, in the bottom. And the Vav Be'em Tisa, Vav in the middle. HaMechaber Eisam, which joins them. Li'ez Be'em Miskalolos. So they should be integrated in what? A Aleph is a yud on top, a yud on bottom, and a line in the middle. So mili alfin means his kalas. That's the point that he's trying to make. It says the Rebbe ve'ikir bechin besayis kalas. But the real truth is that what is the reason that an ela matikun there's integration and sharing who mitzad bechin es habitl? The real issue is not the eres muatim, not the kel muatim, but the ma, the bitl. Ta'ida bechin es chalisha saguf. The body is weakened. Hargosha sets musi the feeling of self. Is diminished. Vahainu, what is it that causes a diminution in the feeling of self? The ma, which comes from chokhma, just like in the human experience, the stronger one's mind is, the more tempered one's and the more balanced one's emotions are. The moyach is the moyach. Chokhma is responsible for the ma, which brings the bittel into elamatilos. Liyasan hoges hamidis apiaseichal dafka. The emotions should be governed by the intelligence. K'mesh Yikosav, as the Pasuk says, Lefi sikhli yehelelish, that a human being's emotions are revealed, the word yehelel means revealed based on their intelligence. Says that Eba on line 40, Yomitad b'chines keich ma'asha b'chokhmah, the property of bitl, which exists in chokhmah shu b'chines ha-bitl, in other words, b'chines ayin. That ma quality is the basis for nasa b'chines eskalos, is an integration of opposites. The base half of the joint together to opposites. Kimei chesed de gevoda yachad v'chulu join together chesed de gevoda and so forth. For I knew, in other words, a mitzah de shtal shlos edin sof. There is a bringing forward of the essence of edin sof through the chain reaction of worlds. Be bechinas ma she bechochma in the ma aspect of chochma, which is bechin is bittel anal the aspect of bittel k'mei shekoso over the test in the pasuk. Eisa shalom b'mreimba b'mechol v'gavriel b'mechol sashemayim b'chulu. When you have two malach and they don't get along. But they're in the presence of Ma, they're in the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, they're both be his batlos, because the one making the peace weakens the two of them. This is the kind of bitl that comes from Ma, according to how this Maimed explains it, that Ma is coming from Chochmah. As a consequence of how things are mystically, when you look at the physical human being, <coughs> pardon me, the physical human being is in the image of Adam Ha'elyin. So in human beings specifically, yesh be'gamkin bechinas eskalos, every human being, so long as he's normal, displays in his emotions balance, integration. Mi beis hofchem yachad. Two opposites coexist. Vechibur v'eskalos michasad agvore yachad. And a human being, there's no such thing as pure kindness and there's no such thing as pure severity and exactitude. Each midah can't, Tains within itself its counterpart, and there is balance and integration. But the other parts of Shalom, which by human beings down here on earth, are unique that they consist of a complete face. That means to say, we don't have one emotion or two emotions or three emotions. Like the Ramam writes in Peter Shamishnai about animals, but we have Kola, Palam, Kulam, we have every single emotion from the most extreme severity and exactitude and cruelty to the most extreme kindness and forgiveness and generosity and so on. <clears throat> which is one of the reasons why we have free will. We have free will because we have all choices. We're integrated with a variety of different poles. And each pole has within itself all the other poles. And therefore the poles are integrated together. Says that on line 46, This also explains the expression of the Zayah. This he, he who is masculine, he, is Raza the secret la chlolo slolo the amina to join the left and the right together? For I knew what is the Zaya talking about? Mitzad ha'aras sheim ma because of the property of ma that according to this maimed at this moment comes from chokhmah it's bechinas bittel anal the aforementioned bittel shemeir b'midas chesed gevura which radiates in the two measures and midas of chesed and gevura and as a consequence v'yechelim v'leiskalel v'lehischaber. They can be integrated and unified based half him to opposites can iskalia. That's it. That's our toyu and tikkun espose. Okay? That's it. 
Tayo and Tikkun are both Atzilus. And again, the, 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 the point that I want to emphasize here, that perhaps in earlier discussions on Tayo and Tikkun was a bit neglected, is the Ma property. Now, remember, we started at this moment talking about food. And the question was, every human being, every creation, has made the piyavaya, is created from the ten utterances of creation. And why is it that human beings are nourished by plant, plants and animals? And like I told you earlier, every living being is nourished by a lesser level, by a lesser caste, lesser plane of living things, and the question is why? So now that we explain Tayo and Tikkun, and we understand that human beings come from Tikkun, and animals and plants come from Tayu. And Tikkun is order and balance. And of course, the most important aspect of Tikkun is the property of Ma, which Tayu does not have. So what emerges is that Tayu is much higher than Tikkun. But Tikkun is much deeper and purposeful than Tayu. So the Rebbe says, now let's talk about food. Vihine, line 48. <clears throat> you do what is known. Shagol, Daimim, Tzameachai. All minerals, plants and animals. Nishtalshulos. They also have descended, evolved from spiritual counterparts in the higher worlds. Beribu madreges through various different steps, through many steps. Beilacherilah from cause to cause. Achiyodu lamata mata till they ascended all the way down here. Vinishavu mayhem and it created from them dvarim gashmi and physical things. Vesharsham and the root of all of the various physical creations that come from the spiritual creations in as much as we're dealing with creations other than Adam, than man, it's Mebechina's Teo Kanal. It's not from Tikkun, it's from Teo, because every creation besides from man is, is a being which is incomplete. He doesn't have all Midas within himself. He has one or two and no more. Vahainu, this means that Mebechina's Merkava Yen, from the supernal chariot. That physical animals come from the faces of the chariot. Domestic animals in the face of the ox. <coughs> Pardon me. Wild animals in the face of the lion. And birds from the face of the eagle, or whatever nesher means. Additionally, all grasses have a source on high. As the Pasuk says, and this Pasuk indicates that physical grass comes from spiritual grass. Now, the Merkava from which animals come is El Mabriya. The Adam we talked about before is El Mo'atzilus. And now the Rebbe continues, Gamkin. Is it not true that the supernal chariot is also Tikkun? Ki yesh lahem bechines bitl, the chariot above also has bitl. As the Pasuk says, the heavenly host is out to you. And I want to make a clarification. Normally, in a Maimed, when it says the word Elyon, it means Atsilos. But over here, Merkava Elyon means Bria, at the very highest. He says, Is it not true that the Merkava of Elyon Bria is battled to Akadish Baruch? And if the Merkava of Elyon Bria is battled to Akadish Baruch, so why is it that from the Merkava of Elyon Bria comes Klippa? comes animals and plants and minerals who cherishes from Tayu. Why not other? The Emrim Kadesh and they recite Kadesh, Shemeir Allah Bittl, which denotes Bittl, Shubhin is a Tikkun, which is arguably the concept of Tikkun. The Gam Nema Behead, moreover, is written, Pnei Neshal Arbaton, which means, Shekolachat Ve'echad Kolum Kolum Lam upon him, each four of the four faces of the Merkava has all four faces. Says the Rebbe, but it's not Tikkun like Ma that we talked about before. Bekomakim nevertheless. Beribu Yishdash is through many steps of a chain reaction of worlds. From their ways, from their byproduct, this it creates physical things. Of all three kingdoms of mineral, plant, and animal, where each creation is a is not a whole replica of the supernal integration. That each one is an aspect. In other words, Merkava Vela Mabriya is not Tikkun. Or to say it more importantly, Merkava Vela Mabriya is not Ma. So even though the physical creations besides from man come from the Merkava, their Shadish is not Tikkun, their Shadish is Teo, their Shadish is, <coughs> is the polar extreme Atsilus that most importantly lacks Ma rather than Atsilus, that's the balanced Atsilus that's defined by Ma by this bit. So of course we got to get to the point of why people have to eat food. When a human being eats food, and of course the human being comes from Atsilus, which is an integrated, balanced world because of the property of Ma. Shu Bechinas Atikun. Bechinas Shei Ma Sheboi. 
And at the heart of Tikkun, in addition to the Eires Muatam and the Kele Merubim and the integration, there is the most basic reason that Atzilus Atzilus, which is Ma, Shabay Yislav Shas Eirin Tzav, is a manifestation of Eirin Tzav. Says the Rebbe Mesala HaMaychel, it raises up the food, that the food which started out in Tayu, which is higher than Tikkun, but fell into Klipa, which is lower than Tikkun, becomes elevated into Adam by a human being eating it. That it should join a healthy system, an integrated system, in the person. When a person eats this food, the strength of the human being is enhanced. And his life. He has the power to daven, to pray with the food he just ate. And to give his life to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. When he says, Echad, with the bittle of the Baruch Hu, Lachain, and as a consequence, Gamma Michael, Miss Alum, Miss Kal, Lachain, is a bittle. The food he eats is also uplifted and integrated. Says the Rebbe on line 60, Vizahu Inyam Birit Hakalem de Tehu. This is the Kabbalistic concept. At the Abish, they created Tehu. And then he shattered it. And then he created Tikkun. And he wants that the sparks of Tehu, which fell when the Elam of Tehu was shattered, should be separated and uplifted and refined and integrated into Atsilos, so that in the world of Atsilos you also have the higher Eiris of Tehu. To be uplifted into the world of balance and order and integration and so on. Now, to be sure, Tehu is higher than Tikkun. But it's not deeper than Tikkun. Wait, so that's the first point. So Tayu has a higher source than Tikkun. If Tayu has a higher source than Tikkun, then when you eat food, the energy within that food is coming from a higher source. But then there's a Vagab, there's a second point. And I want you to know, this second point, I, I don't remember seeing another my mother. Listen to this. The lights of Tayu were uplifted into the level of Ein Sof, which is called Atzmus. The Maila Mimikerim, it's used them above their source as they are of form. In other words, what happens to Elam Atayu? Elam Atayu is the world that shatters. When it shatters, two things occur. The body, the vessels fall. And the light goes away. So the vessels fall. And when you elevate, you eat food, and you elevate those vessels, you reveal their source, which is higher than Tayu, than Adam, than Tikkun. But the lights which departed, the Eidus, Shenis Alu, went all the way back to Latzmos. And when you elevate the sparks of Tayu, you're bringing up the sparks of Tayu that fell. And by association, you retrieve, you bring back down the Eidus of Tayu, re-included in Atzimus. So the benefit for Tikkun is two things. Number one, the sparks of Tayu that fell, which have a higher source than Tikkun, are elevated into Elam Tikkun and become integrated into the balance and integration of Elam Tikkun. Number two, the lights of Eidus that never fell. The lights of Tayu that departed during the Shrita, are retrieved when the Kalim go back up. Now, I put them into two paragraphs, 61 and 62. I deliberately divided them so you should see clearly that the Rebbe is saying two separate things about the benefit that Tikkun has by integrating Teyu into itself. Line 63, now, Hine. First of all, the vessels of Teyu which have fallen are raised up and integrated into Tikkun. Add additional light and life. Gamba Bakhil Satikun to the worlds of Tikkun. <coughs> to bring down the lights of Tayu which have departed. when the vessels become clarified. when the vessels become integrated. The vessels of Tayu become integrated into Kilwa Tikkun. So the vessels of Tayu become uplifted. And when the vessels of Tayu become uplifted, they call back the Eidus of Tayu that departed, which is now line 65. I'm sorry, I, I got it up myself. Line 65. And because the, the root of Tayu, it has a higher source of Tayu, whatever this means. But then Vagam, there's a second point. And what's the second point? That When the vessels of Tehu fell, the lights of Tehu departed. And when the vessels of Tehu were then picked, corrected, they retrieved the lights that departed. Hine, Ayyadei Birr, Kalim the Tehu, by bringing a clarity into the vessels of Tehu, Nimshech Teis Ves Eir, you bring down additional light, which before went away. Gam bebechines atikun into the world of tikun bebechines eid as the teyuk meishem lamaylo bebechines atzmos as they're all the way back in atzmos. 
So Tikkun eats food, elevates the aspects of Tayu that fell and integrates it into itself. And once those aspects that fell are elevated and integrated, they call back the lights which departed altogether. It says the Rebbe, line 68, That's what people have to eat. You're eating for the sake of God. You're not eating for you. You eat because when you eat, you do the Ebrish to the favor. Normally, we talk about a person needing to eat because Tayyip has a higher source than Tikkun and the person needs food. In this Maimer, why is the person eating? Because it's Tzedek Ravei Hashem needs us to eat food because we represent Adam, Ha'elyin. Down here, so that we should elevate the sparks of Tayyip into Adam of Tikkun of Atzilus and bring back down the Eidus of Tayyip which departed altogether. The same thing is parallel than Atzilus. When she goes up as the Pasuk says, Well, the Musakis, the Muskamari on the game, and Atzilus is in the image of man. That Nimshach Bey Gam can taste for Seir Vechayez when we eat food. We elevate the sparks of their back into Atzilus, and as a consequence, more light and life is brought down into Atzilus from himself. Bechinus ate as they have the lights of Tay, which departed, I David or Kale, and the Tay, when we elevate, when we separate, elevate, refine, and reintroduce the vessels of Tay into Tikkun of Atzilus, we bring back down additional light. Who and this explains well, when we talk about benching, we say, When you eat food, you eat, and it satisfies you, and you bless God. Translates the Rebbe, you're bringing godliness down, in other words. You bring it out additional light, into Atsilas. And Atsilas is called, So when you eat, you elevate the fallen sparks of Tayu. And by elevating the fallen sparks of Tayyu, you're retrieving the higher lights of Tayyu. And of Arachas Hashem Alekecha, you're bringing additional light, aid is the Tayyu, into Tikkun, into Atzilus. And that's why the word Adam is with a hey. It doesn't only mean the physical person, it means Atzilus as well. And the Rebbe concludes, line 74. This is the concept of bread from the earth. What does it mean from the earth? Bread that needs bitter. And if I had time, and I don't, I would give you my whole lecture about how food has to be prepared. You can't just pick up food and eat it. You have to harvest it. And you have to process it. And then you have to cook it. And then you have to digest it. So there's at least two and possibly three steps of bitter and food that you have to eat before you eat it, and then the digesting process, and in some cases you have to do it twice. First you have to prepare it. First it has to grow, which is a process of bitter. Then you have to harvest it, and you have to prepare it and cook it. And then when you eat it, you're doing a third bitter. These are all mashalim for the birurim of the sparks of teyu as they're integrated in teyu And we'll continue next week in Mitzvah